we consider such social ostracization as a social crime but the cancel culture which is exactly on the same lines is not taken like that in hollywood we have we hear a lot of stories that a group of people come out and publicly try to cancel people to eliminate them from their social life can we do that that there are many people who spoke against cancel culture not only barack obama i mean also donald trump has been speaking about cancel culture because it was uh, not even disputed by different sides because martin luther king junior was a champion of the black community but he used the word negro that word is not now acceptable it's a cancel word make an accusation make a judgment and they execute it mafia would do it there is no way that you can justify your position and cancel culture come to that level in social life Hello everyone and welcome to the weekend meeting with Sanal Idmalku. I am Shubhi Sinha heading the youth wing of Rationalist International. Uh we have been conducting these Zoom conferences for quite a few years now and also Clubhouse as well and we are happy to welcome all of you in this meeting. Please note that in this session our Clubhouse Zoom and YouTube will will go on to us simultaneously. So once we move to the question answer round, we will take up questions from Zoom participants as well as the participants from the clubhouse. Everybody present in this meeting, I would request you all to turn your videos and audios off. Only when you are asking a question, we would request you to turn them on for recording purposes. the pattern of the meeting would be as regular where sanalit maruku would be speaking for an hour and then we will limit the questions to 30 minutes or maybe a bit more so now the topic uh before i pr- proceed uh if vava do you have anything to say or madhu okay so i think we can proceed to the topic um cancel culture and free speech cancel culture or call out culture is a contemporary phrase used to refer to a form of exclusion in which someone is thrust out of social or professional circle whether it be online on social media or in person those subject to this rejection are said to have been cancelled it is often said to take the form of boycotting or shunning an individual often a celebrity who is deemed to have acted or spoken in an unacceptable manner this new culture is emerging in the us and many parts of the world but to what extent can we accuse people or call them out since there are no legal, uh, legal remedies and society decides the decision many have questioned the validity of the social behavior and many consider it as an array of free speech i would like to welcome mr sanalit maruku to help us understand more about this culture welcome sir thank you shubhi and thank you all friends who are in the meeting in zoom in youtube as well as on clubhouse what's cancel culture how can you cancel somebody well that's possible in the contemporary social media and the contemporary social structures as some people would claim a few years back the whole idea came up when somebody is to be criticized earlier you would court the person make an argument against him make a point against him and make him answerable on the public forum anybody is questionable anybody is challengeable no matter you are a political leader no matter you are a religious leader no matter you are a celebrity artist writer or anybody but if you want to express a different opinion than what he or she would say you have a full right absolute right to express your views criticize the person 
or support the person or ridicule a position or criticize a policy challenge a faith that's your freedom which is guaranteed by the idea of free speech and free expression artistic expression would have a further next step an artist can represent any historical event any contemporary situation or a story from the legends and mythology and interpret the way he or she wants everything that is part of culture and tradition and faith and belief and worship is a free tool for an artist for a painter for a novelist for a poet who is not afraid of the consequences he or she is absolutely free to reinterpret give a new dimension give a new picture to give a new insight ridicule it present it in a different way that's what is free expression that is cherished all around the world in the time of free speech nothing is infallible nothing goes unchallenged in a free world every political leader should understand that he can be criticized in a civilized world every authority should understand the fundamental social position that his views and his policies and his political positions can be challenged the media can criticize him or her any political party or any ideology or any religion can be criticized that's free speech and that's free expression that's one of the greatest values that has started emerging as an important value from maybe last three decades you have seen it in american constitution the first amendment especially you have seen it in the great slogans that the the french uh, revolution has made for example uh, the idea of liberty equality and fraternity you have seen it in the independent struggle that has been growing in different colonies which challenge the authorities of the the, the political power you have seen it everywhere you have seen it in russian revolution you have seen it in french revolution you have seen it in the in the whole enlightenment movement you could see the elements of free speech the elements of free expression the elements of free opinions going forward without being stopped if anybody ever tried to stop it there was international public opinion coming in defense of that in your times if it was not possible history will sanctify you and history will respect you will reevaluate you and give you additional strength than your times opinions have that freedom but also parallelly there is another system which has been progressively growing the judicial system the judiciary the idea of justice every single individual has a right to get justice every single individual who is defamed in the process of free expression of somebody has a right to defend his dignity he can go to a court of law and say that the facts expressed in a, in the course of one accusation against me or one charge against someone or the criticism against one is against the facts withholding some facts you can go and ask for your rights to get out of the defame that was created so it's going parallelly you have free speech at one side you have free expression on the other side and you have the right to defend yourself by answering publicly but if it goes beyond any possibility for you to rectify you can go to a court of law to seek justice if the facts presented are wrong 
So free expression has only one limit now. The limit is that you are not calling for violence. If you are advocating violence, there is no free expression guaranteed for that. If free speech is limited to all civilized behavior. Beyond that, you cannot go that. But civilized behavior also would involve criticism of traditional faith, criticism of a political system, criticism of political power, criticism of political leaders and everything. But what we speak now is something that looks similar, but very different, which is known as the cancel culture. Many people would say cancel culture is something close to the college culture. I hope you, most of you may be knowing what is call out culture and what is cancel culture. These are urban terminologies that are in, pop, in circulation nowadays. And many youngsters would speak about the, the cancel culture or the call out culture. But uh, most of those people who use the classical language would not understand that if they are not in the field of this discussion. Cancel culture is an idea that a person who is under criticism, he has done something or she has done something which is not fitting to the mainstream political view or the so-called progressive views that some people would follow. So then this person would be criticized, that is free speech. There can be expressions against him in a literary form or artistic form, which is free expression. But here, he should be kept away from public life. That is how some people would feel it should happen. Or you're ridiculed totally to the extent that you are socially isolated. You, I mean, you can compare it with the call out movement. Call out is something like, uh, for example, when if you remember when the Me Too movement has started. Most of the cases were genuine cases, but there have been many cases where people were targeted deliberately or, I mean, with a systematic planning. But if some, somebody is accused of something, in the, just in the eyes of justice, in the eyes of laws, the person has a remedy. That's a legal remedy, wherein he can go to a court of law and defend his or her position. If somebody accuses something, it needs evidence. It needs facts to support. It needs a situation where the other person has a right to defend his or her position based on a different perspective. Both sides are to be held, heard, evidences are to be verified, and a judiciary that is trained to understand and evaluate the idea of evidences based on the idea of justice that the nation or the country or the constitution provides and give a judgment. Why we do have judges or the jurisprudence? Because there are certain fundamental laws of justice. The fundamental laws of justice calls for some very primary things that everybody who is accused of something has a right to defend his position. The accusation should be factual with evidences, but the evidences can be questioned. Its authority can be questioned. questioned. And if the evidence presented against somebody is very fate in the fundamental, with the tools that are generally accepted by the jurisprudence, then the person has a right to be acquitted or he may be convicted. So there is a judicial system which has certain laws, which is a, a system of education involved. Certain fundamental principles are involved. Everybody cannot disperse justice. You have to understand the fundamental laws of justice, fundamental laws of jurisprudence, fundamental laws per se you have to understand. Then only you can deliver justice. 
That is why there is a jurisprudence or legal system which is away from the executive and the government. So as you all know, normally modern governments have three major divisions, judiciary, executive, and legislature. The legislature is making laws, the executive is implementing it, and judiciary is interpreting it. This is the classical division. But anybody who speaks something under the uh, frame of free speech or free expression, if that's the right of him, it, is, it will be the judiciary that will judge whether that comes under the purview of free expression or whatever one set in the sphere of free speech is fact-based or an accusation can be nullified because it's not fact-based, but that's the prerogative of the judiciary. But imagine a situation that lumpen people here and there can decide about justice. Just think about Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, many things are considered a crime. For example, if a woman, I mean, they, yesterday's new decision is not covering the face with a veil, that's a crime. That's a new law in Afghanistan. But who would decide? If somebody, okay, if that law is justifiable or not is a different question. I'm not coming on that point, that I will come. But if there is a law in a country, who would implement that law? The implementation is somebody's job. Whether the crime is committed or not is to be judged by somebody, that is some, somebody else's job. That's the job of the judiciary. The accusation is made by the prosecution. There are three agencies there. But if the prosecutor and the person who deliver the justice and who would finally execute it, if imagine if those are in one hand, would you consider it justice? In ancient times, most of the kingdoms, that, that was how it was happening. The king would be the person who would deliver the judgment. King would be the person for whom the accusation was made, and it would be the king who would order the, the justice, imprisonment or execution. But in modern democracies, that's a different thing. But imagine a situation that in Afghanistan, somebody is uh, coming out and who defy a law that is generally considered not acceptable to a civilized society, but a law in Afghanistan, is somebody come, takes the person who is not covering the face to a court of law, and the court of law says that the person is to be executed or imprisoned or stoned or whatever it is. That's on the basis of a certain law that's implemented. Still, that should be challenged by still a larger body who would understand the whole thing in a civilized world, that the violation of fundamental rights happened there. But in the present context, that may not be possible. But even then, there is a jurisprudence required. But in, in many countries, like, like when groups like uh, Taliban in control, they would normally accuse a person. They would themselves make the judgment. And on the street itself, the, the verdict is implemented. Many of you probably would have seen a very famous case of a poetess who was criticizing the Taliban, Taliban regime, was taken to a street square. She was accused of a very different thing than her poetry. When she was wearing her parda, her feet were exposed. That was a crime. Therefore, the accusation was read, the prosecution reads it, her eyes were blinded with the cloth. The Another person would make the judgment right away without she being hurt. And next moment, the verdict is there, she should be shot dead. And in a minute, somebody from behind her head shot through her head point blank. That's a kind of justice, justice in quotation. 
would you approve such a kind of justice no civilized person no civilized society no civilized nation would approve such a society that's why we call taliban a a system that is not acceptable to modern civilization that's why we call the present regime in afghanistan not a proper government that is why we say that such regimes are taking us backward and those are symbols of medieval times but imagine in a modern society in western europe in united states in australia in canada in new zealand or developing countries like in india or in brazil a group of people emerge and accuse a person with something and there is no way that the person can defend because it's a collective effort to defame a person because he has taken or she has taken a position that is not acceptable to this group which consider themselves right a self righteous group and they would make the judgment that the person should be cancelled and what's cancellation if he is a movie director nobody should be acting in his movies anymore a kind of social ostracism is established nobody should see his movie if anybody goes to a movie that is produced by this guy that is against the popular culture they would say we should boycott the person ostracize this person we should cancel this person will such things work yes in many societies such things work in two different ways number one some people would fall prey into this idea for example if uh, somebody is accused of uh, racial discrimination racial discrimination is a crime if one is accused of racial discrimination wherein he did not get an opportunity to prove whether what he said is a racial discrimination or not but if somebody is accused of racial discrimination if it's if the accusation is made by a group of people on social media or in a public meeting and they would say that he is a racist therefore he should be boycotted he should not be seen anymore nobody should invite him to a public stage nobody should see his uh, presentations nobody should buy his book if a person is boycotted like that what will happen lot of people who want to identify with the progressive so called progressive movement that raises this issue they would try to keep off this person because they want to be the collective that decided something they don't want to be alienated different than the group that they wanted to identify with but then that would happen then another set of people who are afraid to offend these people who made the accusation who made this social ostracization they imagine a situation that somebody is just called a racist and his sentence or a view or a public speech is misinterpreted by somebody when it is presented in the public domain they would add one or two words which can totally alter what he said people caught to the convenience of what they want to the convenience of their tunes they add a few words they take away a few words the whole meaning would differ if he is taken to a court of law on this point he could simply say that that's not what i said here is the evidence he can challenge it he can question it he can prove his position here there is no question of a court of law there is no question of any kind of possibility for the person to defend himself but the only possibility for him is to come to the public domain to defend his position where he would feel or she would feel helpless because there is a vast majority of people already convinced because there was a campaign so he is branded a racist he is criticized as a racist nobody wants to hear further he is isolated he is ostracized he is cancelled from the public domain you know one of the first persons 
very powerfully spoke against the cancel culture was Barack Obama. He was a very articulate campaigner against the notion of cancel culture. He said, nobody can be isolated in a society. Nobody can be ostracized in a society. With some statements, some groups would make whatsoever progressive they are. Another person who is a victim of such campaign is Richard Dawkins. I hope you may know that there was a statement where there was one statement Richard Dawkins made in a tweet. He was casually mentioning about a person feeling of a different gender within the person. You know this uh, present day context, people can decide and affirm their gender, transform their gender, they can decide what they want. It's a question of what you feel, what you are. If tomorrow, one of you would feel that you are of a different gender than the public would see, it's your right to decide what gender you have. That's a new value, which is emerging all around the world. There is a very active group defending this right. I would fully share. I would absolutely share that position. I am for this changing value. I am for this position. But what Richard Dawkins did was, he made a sarcastic comment on such a claim with a comparison of that with a person who duped to be a person of a different gender, which was a popular case in the Western culture. And that was taken as an offense. As a result, organizations like uh, American Humanist Association, a very respected rationalist organization, decided to stand against Richard Dawkins. To what extent? Richard Dawkins was given the International Humanist Award some years back. They decided that Richard Dawkins has made a statement against the popular culture of recognizing the gender of people by themselves. Therefore, we don't want him to be recognized as anymore a humanist leader. So we withdraw an international award that we have given to him some years back and they have taken away the award. Imagine that. Nobody has even asked what he meant. He said that he just I mean, out of curiosity and out of half sarcasm, he made a statement in a tweet, and he has a full right to speak that. About the gender, what we consider as the gender is the right gender of people is a question still debated. Can you have a different opinion than the, the popular culture? You can have a different opinion. Certainly, that is free speech. If uh, somebody says, for example, Holocaust is not, I mean, true. There are people who claim like that. You know that a former Iranian president claimed that Holocaust was just a fake story. There was no Holocaust. Can somebody speak like that? If somebody spoke like that, should that person be cancelled from the public culture? Well, I would say that free speech has the full extent possibility and nobody can stop the extent of free speech. If somebody says that there was no Holocaust and it's a fake story, that should be addressed with evidences, with facts. Instead, if somebody says that the person who said has to be cancelled, it's denial of free speech. Imagine there is a you know about uh, a small cult in United States of America, which, uh, which claims that the earth is flat. They have a society, namely the Flat Earth Society. Can they propagate that idea? I mean, it's against science, against facts, against common sense, against everything that we know. But can somebody make such a position? I would say that yes. Yes. They have a right to speak. Whatever absurdities they are, they have a right to speak that. Others should be able to easily expose it and ridicule it. And when some ideas come like that, that has to be explained and that has to be cleared so that no further claim in that direction 
which not would be entertained by people imagine there was another claim we all know that uh, usa has sent people to the moon neil armstrong and uh, uh, all these uh, people who were on the moon is a well known fact but there are some people especially in west asia who believe that that was not true nobody can go to moon they believe that it's it's wrong they say that it was actually a theater that they made in the deserts of arizona they wanted the united states wanted to outsmart soviet union which was in a space competition with united states and they simply made a, a drama and they articulated the whole thing in arizona actually people did not go to moon because nobody can go to moon because it was allah symbol that's how some people would believe you can see articles and articles on the internet if you go on that should we stop that i would say that free speech would not stop that free speech would answer it such claims can still be reported with a mark factually incorrect still they can put their point of view and that is what free speech is what so ridiculous ideas people have they have the freedom to express it and well others can explain it one would think that i mean when that is wrong if they have this opportunity to speak about stupidity and defend stupidity it's futile exercise of other people to explain and explain it that's one argument that we have because we know that our position is right the scientific facts are there therefore we feel that somebody cannot speak about absurdities they have a right if free speech is guaranteed they have a right to speak absurdities also and this permanent education to correct absurdities has to go if you don't do that we will be in a false paradise of our own right positions which is never questioned by absurd people absurd people and absurd ideas should question all facts and correct positions and that should be permanently defended and permanently articulated to keep that position if we cannot do that we will be in a wrong paradise of facts only every fact can be questioned every truth can be challenged but it should reemerge it should come out with more facts to establish it that's the idea of free speech and free expression i why i explain all this in detail is i mean I, before coming to that i would also make in two more examples you know that i've been fighting against all absurd superstitions in india and elsewhere all throughout my life i mean since i was a young man i was doing this job but can somebody defend a superstition or should we legally stop astrology and uh, palm reading or gurudam and or everything should we legally stop everything i would say no we cannot do that if we stop these kind of absurd beliefs or superstitions legally it has an extended life immediately when it is suppressed immediately that gives a new condense to it therefore allowing them to have all their absurdities and getting them exposed with scientific tools is the most important thing that is why when religion is absurd or unnecessary for a modern world is a position that i have but i would never say that religion should be banned it shall be the right of people to believe in whatever they want it shall be the right of people to believe in absurdities you know many things are not correct but still people have the right to believe that we know that smoking can be dangerous to your lungs it's proved very clearly but should we have the right to stop somebody's freedom to smoke no we don't have the right we have the right to tell the people informed adults can take their decisions they shouldn't be they should not be ignorant so the the correct side should be open to them exposed to them but at the end of the day it's the individual who would take the decision this point is important when we come to the cancel culture also anybody can yes 
criticize a position, articulate against anybody, anybody can take a position that is different than the mainstream thought. But for that, you cannot cancel a movement. You cannot cancel an ideology. You cannot cancel a person. You cannot cancel a public presentation. You cannot cancel anything that is an expression of human endeavor. Why it is so? It's very simple. You can make any position, but the person has a right to defend, or the society has many ways to defend it. And that should be exercised. Nobody can be accused of something, and this, a group of people can ostracize them. There are so many examples in our society. For example, somebody is accused of a rape or misbehaving to somebody who is uh, in a vulnerable position. If somebody makes an accusation like that, can that person be cancelled from his area of uh, activity? There are many cases in the field of theatre and cinema and uh, in Hollywood, we, we hear a lot of stories that a group of people come out and publicly try to cancel people, to eliminate them from their social life. Can we do that? No, you cannot do that. You cannot remove a politician from his field if somebody accuses him just of corruption. Imagine a group of people come and accuse a person of corruption. They say that he's corrupt. They repeat it with social media, with uh, so many boards and repeated uh, posts. You keep on making opinion about a person. And then they decide, since he is corrupt, it is not proved, he shall be socially ostracized. Nobody should attend his meeting. Can you do that? No, you cannot do that. If there is a criticism, if there is an... Uh, position that proves that he has violated a law, first of all, he should have a right to defend his position. The facts are to be checked, cross verified and jurisprudence should be delivered by people who understand the laws of evidence and the laws of justice and the laws of jurisprudence fundamental principles. If that's not available, it would be, as we earlier seen, would be like the kangaroo courts of the Taliban, or in, in many other places, we have such groups, you know, articulate groups do such things. Many groups, many radical groups decide that what they think is right, and they try to make an accusation, make a judgment, and they execute it. Mafia would do it. There is no way that you can justify your position. And cancel culture come to that level in social life. I mean, this also comes from another tradition another uh, movement, which is uh, uh, known as the call-out movement. Call-out movement is public shaming of a person. A person is accused of something. For example, a person is accused of, for, for example, a political leader is accused of corruption. So then he is publicly ridiculed and he has no opportunity to explain his position. He has no ways to respond to the accusations and allegations. But before that, he is socially isolated. The, the verdict is implemented by a group of articulate people. Okay, forget about corruption. It can come to other things. If you consider a political position which is not correct, in your view, for example, if a left group considers somebody a chronic capitalist. That's an accusation. They, for them, a capitalist is something uh, wrong, for example. So if somebody accuses a person to be a, an agent of capitalists, can he be isolated? Or uh, if somebody takes a political position which you consider not the right thing, but legally which is a right thing, your group, your, your so-called progressive or reactionary or whatever groups consider something right or wrong. And accordingly, if somebody takes a different position, that person is socially isolated, that person is ostracized, that person is sidelined, that person is pushed away, and there's a collective effort to stop that person coming to public life. If a writer takes a position, which is not a popular view, an unpopular view that is used to ostracize the person. 
Historically, that has been like that. If you see, for example, how the religions have been uh, handling their opponents, take the case of the major religions, like for example, the Catholic Church. All traditional faiths that existed before the predominance of the Catholic Church were called pagan beliefs. And worshiping in pagan gods was considered a sin. And if you sinned by re rejecting an existing god that the system uh, accepted, you would be tried. And you can be purified with pain or burned to death. You can be called a witch. You have no way to justify you. When evidence of a young boy or girl would be taken as a proof that you are a witch because you believed in something other than the mainstream belief of those times, for example, the faith of the Catholic Church. The Inquisition courts were doing the same practice. They identified people, accused them, and punished them. They had no right because they were against the mainstream faith. Okay, Inquisition is over now. Inquisition courts are no more existing, but most of the religions do the same pattern. Imagine a person who challenges Islamic faith in an Islamic majority area in a secular country. In an Islamic country, you don't have that right. I mean, you'll be immediately arrested and you'll be on the death row very soon or you'll be imprisoned for a long time. But imagine in a secular country, if somebody criticizes, for example, Islam in an Islamic majority area, you will be socially isolated. They would make a decision that you should be no, you, you won't be able to buy something from this shop. Your normal rights would be denied. And who decides? Not the legal system, but the religious community decides. Similar cases exist in several forms in the Indian caste system, for example. If you want to find a spouse from a different caste or religion, you are socially ostracized. Sometimes you are punished. You are hacked to death. But if you're not hacked to death, you are canceled in this situation. You cannot anymore participate in any community activities. You cannot go to a, a situation where your family members would be attending. You are socially completely removed. We consider such social ostracization as a social crime. But the cancel culture, which is exactly on the same lines, is not taken like that. So therefore, the idea that speaks against cancel culture comes from a very clear position that individuals have free speech. They have the right to defend themselves. Nobody should take law in their hand and justice and jurisprudence in their hand. Nobody shall have the right to isolate a person, ostracize a person, or keep a person off from his job or his career or his artistic profession or his literary uh, field. So people are accountable. There is a public accountability also. If you are a public person, if you are contesting an election, you are publicly accountable. But you accuse somebody of something and publicly isolating a person, publicly ostracizing a person, not allowing him to come to a public stage is something that the cancel culture is advocating and which is not acceptable. When the call out movement, People have criticism against somebody. And they think that they have to be called out publicly and publicly shamed. They have normally no right, no possibility. They have a right, but they have no possibility to defend themselves because it's a kind of a, uh, a, a group verdict, a, a articulate group who decides that what their position is absolutely right stand against your right to defend yourself and speak for yourself and they take the law in their hand and isolate you. So therefore, the cancel culture has something which is totally unacceptable to a civilized society. I mean, of course, there are many people who spoke against cancel culture, not only Barack Obama, I mean, also Donald Trump has been speaking about cancel culture because it was uh, not even disputed by different sides. But from where? 
the word cancel culture come. If you go to the roots of this, uh, the whole cancel culture idea, you can identify that there was a pattern of celebrity hunting in society for some time. If you want to isolate a celebrity, a competitor can use several methods to isolate that person. You can isolate a competitor. You can give a wrong idea in the market. You can spread a rumor. That's how many people would try to defeat a competitor. In any competitive business, in a profession, in a business, in, a, in when products are produced, you use bad publicity, a wrong campaign. And then you tell people to boycott a product or boycott a person. Is that allowed? It is not allowed. You cannot make such wrong claims about people. And the, the celebrity hunting or successful product hunting is a, is a pattern that is against all ethical standards. Another thing, the racist attack on people. Many people are suddenly attacked that out of the blue, some sentence what they said could be racist or misogynistic because the language is transforming, as we all know. Many words that we used earlier are considered bad now. If you remember the very famous speech of uh, Martin Luther King Jr., I have a dream. That's that wonderful speech. Wherein, if you remember, he speaks about Negroes in that. But can you use the word Negro now? You cannot. It's now considered a cancelled word. Word. You have to use instead black. Or the, the black community now living in America should be called African American. The other words are cancelled. So, but can you cancel? Because Martin Luther King Jr. was a champion of the black community, champion of human rights. He was a champion who fought against discrimination, but he used the word Negro. That word is not now acceptable. It's a cancel word. So if you use a different word, then you belong to a different culture and you can be socially ostracized. In India, many people would know, would know that. India has a, a caste system, which is a discriminatory system, not acceptable. It's socially dividing people. It's a hierarchical. There is untouchability involved in caste system. So caste system is not a system that is justified by anybody officially. In any case, the social discrimination is existing in different forms, but nobody would officially justify it. But Gandhi, the, the father of the nation of India, who was also accused of defending caste system by one of his uh, colleagues, I mean, contemporaries, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, Gandhi defended caste system in the earlier part of his life, but he changed his position and he eventually he became a champion of the untouchables and he lived whenever he came to the capital of India, he lived in the, in the colony of the untouchables. So the, the untouchables officially they are called the scheduled caste because they are in a schedule which is mentioned in the constitution as the, the, the communities that are social, they, they were socially isolated for a long time and therefore they are in the schedule, they are called the, the most neutral word is scheduled caste. The word that Gandhi used to identify them was Harijan. He was uh, trying to present things closer to his spiritual ideas. And Hari means Vishnu. And he wanted to present them as Vishnu's people, God's own people. So the counter movement against him, especially the, 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 the Indian Dalit movement, as they call it, they wanted to use a different word for the untouchables or the scheduled caste, not Harijan, which is considered to be a very bad word now for them. And they would call them Dalits. So now the most popular word to identify the scheduled caste in India is Dalit. If you use the word Harijan, immediately there will be shouting against you from the Dalit community because that's a word they have cancelled. But Gandhi had a magazine namely Harijan. 
Should we speak about that ever? Should we speak about this transformation of uh, the focusing of names? What is wrong in speaking about history? And of course, our sensibilities grow and we change words, which is understandable. But should we cancel people, cancel opinions, cancel history, cancel traditions? Because sometime in the history, it was used in a different format. You know that Abraham Lincoln has been fighting for the rights of the blacks. He has been asking for the voting rights of them. And when he presented this idea, he, to convince the, the people who were opposed to the rights of the, the black community, he made a position and he said, we have to give this right to these people this moment. If we do not do that now, they would come tomorrow asking for more things. Therefore, it is in our interest that we give this right to them. That was an address he made to those people who are against giving equal rights to the black people to convince them. If we, can we take out of context this sentence and criticize Abraham Lincoln to be a racist? That's how the cancel culture would say. So people should be judged throughout history, throughout territories with our correct positions, what is politically correct at this moment, should be the only tool that we use to understand things from the past and things that are happening at different parts of the world who did not get to this position. There are several levels of understanding in different countries. For example, in European Union, the rights of genders are respected absolutely. But in many other communities, it's not like that. Go to Saudi Arabia, getting a, a right to drive on roads is celebrated as a great victory now. That you can go out without a male accompanying person is now allowed and that's considered a great victory. And whereas there are parts in the world where women have absolute equality, there are parts in the world, for example, countries in Scandinavia where almost absolute equality of all genders. There is no misogynic atmosphere in the social system here, but things are different in different parts of the world. They are even getting a right to drive a car without criminalized is a major step. So shall we try to judge situation in other countries on the basis of your right at a different part of time and different part of the globe? I would say that there should be a universal way of understanding things. The highest positions of values and highest positions of understanding of justice and highest position of equality should be made as a model, like in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And people who are struggling to come to that position should be encouraged at one side, and they should not allow others to isolate them in their effort to come out from that situation. And no law of any land should stand against the individual right to progress, to come to the international levels of understanding of human rights and free speech. So if you take all these situations in a nutshell, I would say very clearly that the cancel culture, the cancellation of ideas, cancellation of views, cancellation of persons would be not acceptable to a civilized society. I can bring one more example. For example, we all know that, I mean, the, the Nazi movement is something that has been giving a very bad uh, mark on our history. It's something we would never like to see anywhere in the world. Should we, therefore, legally stop anybody who would write a book about Hitler? Can we publish Hitler's book, Mein Kampf? Should that be stopped? Or take another example. In some of the Baltic countries, some symbols which was part of the political power, for example, the, the sickle and the hammer was the symbol of the communist movement. 
and Communist Party was ruling these countries. It's not legal to print or present or show this symbol. It's illegal. It's illegal along with Sostika of the Nazi movement. It's a kind of cancellation that symbolizes something that they consider very bad. For many people, communist movement was an equal movement like Nazi movement. Some people consider as a great liberating point. Whatever is it, should one cancel symbols like that? Should one cancel books? Should one get an official sanction for publications? Imagine a time in history where church wanted to have a right to decide what people should read. Earlier, the church should approve any printed work before its publication. A certificate of sanction was important. They call it imprimatur, a symbol of approval. So those books which did not have the certification of the church were all banned practically. You cannot read it. If you read it, that's as equal as doing a sin. And if you look at the great classics of our times, what we consider throughout history, most of these books we see as books which were not approved by the Catholic authorities. Should we go to those lines? The modern period is the times of freedom. We are living in a society which is further going forward. Our values are progressing. Our ideas of justice is progressing. Our ideas of freedom is changing. Our ideas about free expression and artistic expression is still growing. Our values are evolving further to become something better than yesterday or still better than today. So should we adapt to the new situation or should we insist on close societies with their ideas and try to ban people and ban ideas and ban views and ostracize people who are having a different view? Can people be thrown out of their jobs because somebody accused something? Can people be isolated completely because somebody is speaking something which is not the mainstream point of view or what is considered right by the majority of the people? No, you cannot do that. So the cancellation culture or the cancel culture is absolutely non acceptable. But imagine, this is where I would like to conclude to understand the whole idea from where it comes. It comes from, from a very unlikely place. Many people think that it's a very progressive movement that we can take justice in our hand and we, the social movement, social media decide everything and we call out people and we cancel people and we eliminate people and we make our own decisions, which is beyond legal system, beyond jurisprudence, beyond any kind of justice, we can decide. We are a group. We collectively decide. The mob mentality is in prevalence. But it comes from a very misogynic source, in fact. It's very ironic. But uh, uh, it comes from a 1991 film. The term comes from a 1991 film. New Jack City was the name of the film. And uh, so wherein Wesley Snipes plays uh, as a gangster. Uh, the gangster's name in the movie is Nino Brown. On one scene, after his girlfriend breaks down because of all the violence he is causing, he dumps her by saying, quote, cancel that bitch. I'll buy another one about a person, about a lover, about somebody who was part of his life. He calls, cancel that bitch. I'll buy another one. It's a very misogynistic, very brutal, unacceptable I mean, way of conversation. But it's a, from a character who is a kind of a mafia boss speaking in a movie. But that's the this this that's where this word is coming, canceling a person. It's who are using this? The people who are speaking for ideologies, who are speaking for progressive views, who are speaking for uh, rights of races, who are speaking against discrimination, all good people. People who are standing for progress are good people, in my view. People who are standing for justice are good people. But 
you have articulated movements which wants to implement justice more faster than the jurisprudence and you take your ways and you want to cancel people which is not acceptable that is against the principles of natural justice so the the whole idea of uh, cancellation or calling out and public shaming ostracization etc are celebrated by some people many people like it and many people want to justify it but it's absolutely unacceptable for a civil society thank you very much well thank you sanu sir i think we can move on to the question answers now so if anybody wants to ask a question click on the hand raise tool icon for asking and try to be as precise as you can with your question we also have our clubhouse linked as mentioned earlier so we'll take up platforms from both uh, we have rajesh rohini on uh, our clubhouse so i would just request him to uh, proceed with this question yeah please thank you thank you for giving an opportunity so i'll get to my question so in the first part of your speech you said that the only exception to free speech is inciting violence you also said that cancel culture is ostracizing people um and those who do that are being sectarian but the fact is the modern cancel culture especially in the digital world it's not done by violence it is usually done by calling out someone and also by petitioning to authorities by saying that this person is propagating hate speech and if the authorities agree with this they will, they might remove the person and they might take some action so that's how the modern cancel culture works so i don't see any use of violence here and i see each and every party here is basically exercising their freedom of speech so when you say cancel culture proponents are are being sectarian are in queue labeling them and when you say they don't have the right to ostracize people are in queue essentially speaking against their freedom of speech thank you uh, rajesh uh, i would fully agree that if somebody is uh, for example if uh, you have a, a different point of view against somebody somebody is for example is into hate speech or racist comments you can who would decide about that the decision making should come from a, a system that we approach through jurisprudence through the process of justice so you can complain if you i mean if you your point is i mean of course if you are doing only group complaining and making reports that's something which is perfectly okay there is no point of ostracizing a person at that level but before the verdict of the jurisprudence if you decide that you would not allow him to work his work will be taken away cancelled and his activities will be cancelled and he is a public speaker so his speeches will be cancelled as a writer his publications will be cancelled that amounts to violence against that person's right there is a big difference in you taking law in your hand and you implementing the the verdict against him and you apply it of course i mean there is no dispute on one's right to complain against the person report about the person public opinion is built up and he should have the right to defend his position also that's how free speech would work but you have no right to take a person out of his work i mean in hollywood you can see a lot of examples that people are taken out of work just because somebody accused something and the anti racist movement generally accuse many people of racist which they say that we are not racist but still they are isolated take it richard dawkins case i mean when he was attacked of uh, being uh, gender biased i mean he says he was not he wants to explain it but an award given to him is taken away from him this is what i said that i mean it's i mean that is not violence that's a public uh, decision of a, a certain people but the person involved should have a right to defend his position any number of people complaining against a person does not give a guarantee to socially isolate a person thereby doing a criminal activity against his freedom to do his work to do his uh, profession or practice whatever he wants or to defend his position you cannot take law in your hand that's violence of course there is no no dispute on the point of social campaigning opinion making reporting yes that all you can do 
but you cannot decide. You cannot stop somebody's public life. You cannot stop somebody's profession. That's the point. Just uh, one more part to that question. So yeah. if we take an example of Twitter banning people who are anti-vaxxers or who are spreading misinformation that actually causing death of people, aren't they aren't Twitter essentially exercising their freedom of speech? So can we blame Twitter for taking law into their hands and deciding for their own without being a court, uh, without getting a court verdict? So for example, Donald Trump was um, ousted. So can we say that uh, Twitter was not right in doing that? Well, that's an interesting question. Can one speak against vaccines? I would say, yes, people should be able to speak against vaccines if they feel it's right. And I have the full right to explain to people that this is an absurd campaign. And anybody, you know, one of the major patterns that is used in reporting by BBC, they have made a very good yardstick of handling this. Whenever such claims are made, for example, see the example of Trump. When Trump claimed that the election was not correct, Twitter decided to take him off. I would say that that's against free expression, no doubt about that. But BBC, instead, they said, Trump said so and so. That is free opinion is taken to people. This is what he claimed. We have, I have, you have a right to know what Trump said. I don't accept it. I reject it. But I have a right to know what he said. So BBC reported what Trump said. And in bracket, they said that this claim is not substantiated. That's their position. Their responsibility to inform people that this is a position which is not substantiated. And it's, it's against the facts that we are aware of. That's how BBC published. That's one of the best ways of presenting unpopular, unacceptable position. For example, anti-vaxxers, can they have demonstrations in the street? Most of the developed countries, most of the Western countries, they're allowed to have demonstrations. Can you make a public speech, a YouTube video about your position on vaccine? If you don't accept vaccines at all, there are a lot of people who don't believe in vaccines. At least 10% of the developed world has skepticism about vaccines. Unfounded, of course, but should we stop it? Should we suppress it? Or should we counter it? Free speech would demand countering it. And when somebody wants to speak against vaccine, it can be published because we have a right to know what are their claims. What do they say? I have a right to know, you have a right to know. But if the, the publishing authority is responsible, they can say that the claims are not substantiated. It's not proved, but still we have a right to know what they said. That's how free speech should work. Okay, thank you for the great answer. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Uni Krishnan Raman on Zoom. I would request you to proceed with your question. Uh, sir, a good uh, subject. And anyway, uh, last one month, I cannot see your uh, Zoom uh, programs in weekly. Uh, this is the first time I'm attending. Uh, last one, before one month, there is a regular uh, Sunday program I can see and I am attended also. Anyway, uh, your uh, subject is very interesting subject, culture and it's speech also. But the speech, the you can speak or any can, anybody can speak in the world, anything can speak. But it is, you are not saying it's a hate speech is coming. And those we have to ignore it. And culture, and you said already in the culture, uh, racism and uh, national uh, integration, all, all this culture, it is uh, it is a freedom of thoughts, freedom of liberty, it is coming that point. But uh, why we want to promote those speech, hate speech, I'm talking about the hate speech. Uh, once you uh, complete the answer, then I have another question. Thank you. See, the question is, how do we define hate speech? So if somebody has an opinion, which is not the most popular view that is existing in this society. If one has a very articulate position against the socially acceptable position, can that be considered a hate speech? If somebody says that what you consider right historically is wrong, somebody may feel offended. But you, do you have a right to speak about that? You have a right. 
And many things that are presented as hate speech by the authorities are not really hate speeches, but they are opinions which are not popular. Opinions that are against the mainstream point of view. So hate speech is a convenient tool of political authorities as well as social authorities to suppress opinions which are not convenient for them. So I would say that the whole idea of hate speech, if it is not specifically against a community, for example, if somebody is calling violence against a community of a special people who are speaking a special language or a gender, that doesn't come under the protection of free speech. But if somebody wants to speak something that is not acceptable to what the majority of the society believes, should one have that right? Yes, they should have that right to speak. That's not hate speech. Hate speech is a terminology that is developed by a set of people, especially with the influence of religious authorities, to get a protection shield against criticism. Because most of the criticism are inconvenient for them. Because that is taking the attention of the youngsters in these communities, and that is attracting them to go out. Therefore, they want to make a shield against that, telling that, well, we are our religious sentiments are hurt. Our, your, what you speak is a hatred against us. So if somebody is, if the social values are built up, which can identify what is hate speech and what is free expression, there's a very clear demarcation that you can see. And I would say that hate speech will only constitute those speeches or those opinions that would call for violence or discrimination against any set of people. If not, that cannot be called a hate speech. You can put anything under hate speech. For example, Article 295 in Indian Constitution, for example, is asking for criminal action against a person who is with malicious intention hurting the religious sentiments of somebody. And what is malicious intention? That can be defined by any people. But criticizing, why should people get hurt by, I mean, somebody else's speech? If somebody believes in something, why do they feel hurt? If somebody claims that Allah is the only God and no other God is a God, Allah Akbar, or La ilaha illallah, for example, it's clearly hurting a lot of other people's faith. No other God is a God, but Allah is the only God. And those who believe in Krishna or those who believe in Jesus Christ or those who believe in any other gods can take as a hatred speech against them. And nobody will be saved if you don't follow this faith. This is hatred speech against those people who follow some other faith. If you extend the possibility of it, that can be, I mean, taken to any, anybody. For example, imagine in a country where a particular religion has absolute majority and the system is based on a religious faith, anybody who propagates anything against that can be considered a person who is indulging in hate speech, hatred speech. In a developed society, that may not be considered a hatred speech. For example, publishing a picture or making a cartoon of a Muhammad can be hatred in Saudi Arabia. But it's not hatred in uh, uh, France, for example. In the France textbooks, the picture that was controversial, this uh, famous uh, picture of uh, that caused violence practically. I mean, some Muslim fundamentalists have gone and attacked the publication office and killed many cartoonists and all. And that particular picture of Muhammad is reproduced in the school textbooks now. And that's not taken as hatred there. So what is hatred? It's a question of where you stand. And where you stand is the most important position. I would say that we should, if you stand at the high point of public understanding, many things that the lesser societies, I would say lesser societies, which means where tolerance is not there, I would consider them a lesser society, where lesser societies consider hatred, you would understand that the, the more civilized you become, you would you are bound to have more tolerance. Your own system can be questioned, your own views can be questioned, your own faith can be questioned, and others would be able to defend them. And what is hatred is 
only understood, I think one should only consider if it's calling for violence, calling for practical discrimination against people, that should be stopped because that's getting into the right of other people to be considered equal or to live in peace. No other thing is a hated speech. No other thing is violation of any kind of rights. Uh, now we have Kunjama on uh, Clubhouse. I would just ask you to unmute yourself. Good evening. When I saw the subject, uh, cancel culture, I got surprised, you know, the word cancel culture, I heard first time in January 6th, uh, when this uh, GOP insurrection took place. They used certain words to organize people. One word was cancel culture, the other one was uh, uh, walk and then storm. So I thought this belonged to a culture. Now I understand this is not something like that. Cancel culture word was there. I personally didn't know about it. Anyway, that cancel culture word caused that January 6th so much crime. So many people. So I felt so much pain. When I heard the um, cancel culture, I thought something bad is coming. Somebody will be killed. Something will be destroyed. You know how many um, millions and billions of dollars was destroyed that day. And so many cases are still going on. Many are in, in, in incarcerated. They are being punished. Then uh, that, that's on that way. Now somebody uh, mentioned about a Twitter account. I also have a Twitter account. I do write my opinions in Twitter account. I do get responses. Uh, now, Twitter account belongs to Elon Musk, I think. Now, there is words are going on. Elon Musk bought it to suppress uh, GOP opinions. I don't think so. So, I think uh, if some, some word is not hurting somebody mm -hmm. or moving as a cult, uh, it is okay, I think. I really don't have a question, but this was uh, my feelings. I was very much excited uh, when you took uh, to talk on cancer culture because I myself didn't know much about this particular word. Now I have some idea. Thank you very much for this time. Thank you, Mrs. Kunyama. I see some of the examples I can tell you how this, for example, works. Uh, Meg, the British royal family member, there's a tweet, very famous, just making a, a tweet, which was uh, reproduced by thousands of people. Meg loves orange. She is cancelled because this person hates orange. Very simple. But that, that was a curious one, I mean, which, which became very popular at one side. Look at another one, Lady Sipo. Travis Court is homophobic trash. His music is cancelled. He's cancelled, guys. If you still like him, please unfollow me. So listen, a person is accused of homophobic. Homophobia is something I would not accept. People have their right of their sexual orientation. It's absolutely their right. And nobody else has any business in that. But if somebody is a homophobic, that doesn't stop his music. I may not accept the, the positions of many people. But I would not have a hesitance to, to value the literature that a person would write. For example, if, if somebody is uh, I mean, having a position which is against your political views, would you refuse to read his uh, books? Many are, there are many people who would ask for that. You are not a wretch. Therefore, you are cancelled. It can be told by a leftist movement by anybody. Or you can say that, I mean, if you're a, a Muslim activist, you can say that uh, he does not like Islam. He is cancelled. You can say that. That is a wrong idea, wrong uh, way of seeing things. And people should not be seen or their literature, their art, their public appearance, everything should not be decided by their views on something else. You have no right to reject a person from society. You have no right to take away a person from the society. That's the whole thing. 
I don't like Donald Trump or his policies, but I don't accept that the Twitter stopping his tweets was right. It was not right. In my view, Trump had every right to tweet his absurd point of views. Twitter could have said that the facts speak differently. They could have, they, I mean, made a point. Everybody wanted to know at that time what Trump would say. If that is taken away, your right to know things is taken away. That is where free speech works. You cannot cancel anything. Nobody, no state, no authority, no religion can cancel things. We all have right to know what's happening. Right things and wrong things, we have the right to know it. And it's we who decide what we want, not the authorities, not the social media companies, not the governments. We decide what we want, what is right or wrong. And those people who want to defend their position, they should articulate it. They should not block things. That's the idea of free speech. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we can move on to the next person. Uh, we have Ratish KK on Zoom. Hi, good evening all. Hi, sir. So my question is, uh, someone is uh, violating the law of a country or the law of a system. So what is wrong in cancelling him? Once we enter any social media, once we register uh, the, any social media, we accept certain terms and conditions. And that it's clearly mentioned hated speech, all those we should not post in those media. So once we someone does it, if the media or the system ban him, is there anything wrong in that? That's my question, sir. The whole question is, who would decide that? Who would decide that? For example, mass reporting, some, some friend has been mentioning about mass reporting as a right. Okay, but on mass reporting also, who would make the judgment? Algorithms would make the decision. Nowadays, people may not be involved. If there are a certain number of reporting against a post, it can be removed. The person can be removed. Even there are millions and millions of uh, you know, social media accounts are there. Individuals are not looking into the complaints, but uh, the numbers are decided. The words are looked into by algorithms. But what happens, one example is, you know about uh, James Randi, one of the greatest fighters against all kinds of obscurantism that we know, and who was a legend in the United States. Eight times his Facebook account was stopped. It was cancelled practically. So he had to go out and fight for it. There is another group in Canada, Atheist Republic. Armin Nawabi is an Iranian uh, who lives in Canada. He's a friend of mine also. I mean, he has been publishing a lot of uh, interesting videos. Some are very provocative. His one famous or infamous uh, tweet was about a sexy Kali. I mean, which was a, but therefore, after this video, there are many cases against him and his uh, Twitter account is not seen in India. And also, there are a lot of complaints to YouTube and his YouTube monetization was removed. They were depending on the monetization YouTube for their activities. So they had to fight for one whole year to convince that they did not do anything wrong. Whatever they have done was correct. So mass reporting or somebody deciding to stop people without even understanding what they are speaking is possible in this world because many of these systems work on the basis of public scrutiny, which is not correct actually. One should have some other little more, what you call open ways to understand things. Now the special question that you asked in the beginning, that if you violate a law of a country, can you be canceled? So if that is correct, for example, if you are in Iraq, and if you are a gay, you are violating a law that can call death punishment. You can be cancelled physically. You can be taken to the gallows and executed for that. And if you are in Saudi Arabia or United Arab Emirates, at least as, as per law, practically they are not doing it nowadays. They are trying to liberalize. But if you publicly denounce Quran, if you question the authority of the the prophethood of Muhammad, it's blasphemy and that's punishable with death. In Pakistan, anybody who denounces Muhammad is punishable with death. So you're violating a law. 
can you do it you are cancelling not only his speech but you are cancelling the person to exist as a person also nobody has the right to cancel individuals if he's a, a public disturbance if, if that can be proved that he is permanently making violent action which can be destroying others life he can be kept in a prison but you have no right to cancel a person's life you have no right to take away the opinions of people you cannot have no right to cancel views that's the whole point we are trying to say if you do that you are going the saudi arabia way you are going the pakistan way so if you are doing that you have to go to any extent but the fundamental idea is you have the right to speak if somebody speaks against holocaust i would say that what an absurd person but i have a right to know what stupidity he has said i have a right to know and who are you to decide that i don't have a right to know it if social media should not take public freedom to understand things or no views that we don't like we have a right homeopathy is absurd we know but somebody wants to defend homeopathy i would like to know what he speaks or should we just stop it then we would never understand what are their arguments we would never be able to answer it because it would be banned so banning is not the way stopping is not the way cancelling is not the way allowing things if it's not hurting your life if it's not calling violence if it's not you are taking away your freedom fundamentally you have no right to stop it so you you i would say that laws many in many countries laws are stopping the, the right of people to speak things laws are cancelling people but these laws have to go they are primitive laws they are unacceptable to modern society they have to change the laws have to change not the people have to change okay thanks sir yeah thank you uh, i would just go through again and see if anybody has a question uh, i think we have shaptar ji bhattacharya on clubhouse i would just ask you to uh, proceed with your question good evening sir good evening good evening so i have uh, two questions one is don't you think this uh, cancel culture has come up because our justice system is so slow in giving justice to people that they have people have lost uh, faith that the justice system will give them free so they go for their own way of giving justice and that way of giving justice maybe it is a crude way of giving justice but the public at large feels uh, uh, satisfied for example we saw in me too movement which was there is still there uh, many people were called out for their uh, for harassing other gender or uh, harassing sexually other people in the organization but uh, most of them were not proved in the court of law but uh, people were happy that uh, some sort of justice was meted out although the due process was not followed so do you think it is uh, because of the failure of the justice system as such this cancel culture has got uh, encouragement to come up i will ask the second question after this to an extent you are right satyashi i mean is one of the justification for cancel culture but to what extent but who has the right to take law in their hand and dispense justice are they trained to understand what is right and wrong what is right in the public perspective and what is wrong in the public perspective cannot be right and wrong in the eyes of law for example in many countries including my own country india in many places if a man and woman i mean sit in the dark shadows in the evening all alone there will be immediately a group emerging around them asking why are you there are you really married i mean these kind of questions are to be answered there can be a group of people attacking you these kind of things happen because they have a wrong understanding about their rights and they want to implement their rights on the basis of their way of justice and they want to apply it also so what is right and what is wrong is not in the hands of people who take law in their hand but in the hands of people who understand law and the due process of law as you rightly said is an important factor delay in justice sometimes is one reason that many people think that they want justice to happen immediately and what is justice if somebody is accused of killing somebody they want to see that the person who is accused 
is killed almost in the same way. If one, if there is one eye taken, his eye to be taken back. For one teeth, the, his teeth. Or for his life, for somebody's life, his life. But even without even understanding how he would be able to prove that he was not there, he was not the person. The opportunity is not given by a gang or a group or a collective. The collective cannot decide what is justice. That's number one. Though justice sometimes is delayed, but justice delayed is always better than justice denied. As a classical quote about justice. Another example. Look, in Pakistan, for example, as you all know, if you, if you denounce Muhammad, you can get a death punishment. But you, they have to prove it that you have, with deliberate intention, you have done it. But recently, some months back, a factory manager who was of Sri Lankan origin, who was uh, on whose gates there was a poster of somebody with a quote from Quran on his gate. And of course, he teared it off. That was an election campaign or something like that. But he was accused by the mob that he has insulted Quran because there was a quote from Quran in the poster. He just teared off the poster on his gate. And the mob decided because they thought the justice of Allah is that anybody who denounces Muhammad or Allah should be punished. That is for them is justice. And they didn't want the court to come. They didn't want that, that to be tried in a court of law. They decided to implement the law. They caught him. They went to his office, drawn him out, and they have beaten him. They have hit him with stones and kicked him. And he had 98 broken bones and he was hacked to death. They have taken law in their hands because they thought that is justice and that's to be implemented fast. They don't want to wait for the next day, next minute. They want to do it there and then. So that is the problem of the whole thing. There can be limitations in implementation of law, but there should be, should not be limitations of implementing justice. Sir, another question I have is uh, regarding this, uh, you know, in India we hear that uh, many times, it is a little funny that people say we have freedom of speech, but we should not offend others. Means our freedom of speech does not mean to offend others. As a uh, as a person who who really wants means who likes freedom of speech, I would say uh, the ultimate test of freedom of speech is offending others. If you are not if you are told not you are not allowed to offend, and say, then you you cannot say that that it is a freedom of speech. Then it is it has got lot of restrictions because what is offense? Now uh, we saw uh, a few weeks back that. Even in Sweden, they had even burned the Quran, and that is the extent of freedom of speech in certain places they would like to exercise. Whereas in certain countries, like democratic countries like India, even a very harmless type of Twitter, uh, somebody, you know, some politician called out the prime minister as Nathuram God says uh, the, something like uh, follower or something like that. And he was arrested and taken from Gujarat to Assam, and MLA was taken. So, I means, what do you think? What type of education should be given to people from childhood that they understand what is freedom of speech? I think freedom of expression, freedom of speech, and how to tolerate uh, others' views and to accept others' views. Though that thing has to be means given imparted as an education as a part of education so how do you think that can be imparted because in india we say we have freedom of speech our constitution guarantees it but uh, you know the practical issue it is not really there and there are some very uh, means very peculiar laws like the blasphemy laws which are still there in the statutes so how to go about it as you know in india the criminal laws were actually made in 1857, which was, of course, modified. And the Criminal Procedure Code also was made at that time. The Indian Penal Code as well as the Criminal Procedure Code were made much earlier when the British India was officially established. But the Indian Constitution came into being in 1950. At that time, India did not make a criminal law for itself or a civil law for itself. So it has followed the earlier thing, which was almost a full set of... Uh, legal system, which is part of the Indian judiciary also, 
Therefore, India at that time decided to follow the same criminal laws, which is Indian Penal Code and Indian Criminal Procedure Code. But whenever something is coming in violation of the fundamental rights of people, or the fundamental rights which are guaranteed, which are not violatable, that would become null and void. That was one of the guarantees that we had. The other guarantee was, if anything is violative of the common justice, it can be nullified by a, a jurisprudence. So by implementing, um, by bringing it to the public, uh, I mean, knowledge, by, by way of understanding on the basis of the constitution, many primitive laws were modified also. For example, many laws that were based on Victorian ideas were modified. So this process is going on. But all the same, the crux of Indian constitution, which is the, which clearly says freedom of speech, belief, worship, faith, conscience, everything is guaranteed there. But our education system in India is not giving an idea about these rights of people. We are against all kinds of discrimination. In our textbooks, we are not speaking against discrimination, that we shall not have any kind of discrimination. We all have the right, we all have to have tolerance. These all have to be taught to people in the classrooms, in the primary schools itself. That's one of the ways to correct it. But on the other side, can somebody interfere into it? Can these laws to be uh, can, can these law, laws be interpreted in a way that your rights are taken away? You should not be able to do that. I would say that if anybody feels that their rights are taken by somebody else, uh, free expression, who is wrong? The person who is offended is wrong. If I feel that somebody is speaking something which I don't like, but come on, he has the right to say that. Somebody is criticizing me. I need not offend. I am not a person who cannot be criticized. They have the right to criticize me. Any politician, anybody in the public life is under public scrutiny. People can criticize them. People can ridicule them. People can make joke about them. People can draw cartoons of them. People can make humor about them. Right to ridicule, right to make humor, right to criticize is a fundamental right. Right to blaspheme is a fundamental right in many countries. Because you all have the right to speak what you think right. You can only, the only limitation is that you cannot advocate violence against other people. Any kind of idea, political idea, religious idea, social idea can be questioned. We all have that freedom. If we stop that, civilization would stop growing. So nothing is stoppable by people. For example, if some, can you criticize the Indian prime minister or American president? You should be able to criticize the prime minister or American president or the British, uh, I mean, prime minister. You should be able to do that. And if you cannot do that, the system has some limitation there. If somebody makes baseless allegations, that can be, I mean, addressed by a single explanation. If one makes totally absurd things, that will be exposed by itself. That can be answered by responsible people. But on the other side, a person can be made responsible if he is making false claims. False claims to propagate some idea, he can be made responsible for that. If you defame a person, you have a right not to be defamed. So you can go and get legal remedy for that. But the right to defame is also there. But the right to get a remedy for the defamation that happens is also there. You cannot stop a person from speaking. You can criticize any authority, any system, any law, any policy, any, any, any politician, any actor, anybody you can criticize. And that's, that should be with facts. If facts are misquoted, I mean, of course, that can be addressed in a different way, but your right to speak in a normal situation with facts is your right. But you cannot take law in your hand. You cannot. Uh, on that basis, you cannot punish people. You can speak it. And that can be answered also. There is no single politician in any democracy who is not under public criticism. Every single politician, every single public activist is under scrutiny of people. There are many criticisms. They have different, there are people who have different views. They are criticizing them. They are opposing them. And that's how things grow. People should be under scrutiny. Then they would correct themselves, they would modify themselves, or they will defend themselves their position. That should be possible.
that's also society is grow next we have um, manoj nair with us uh, namaskaram sanal ji sanal ji i just joined 10 15 minutes back so i haven't been able to hear your discourse but i am planning to listen to your youtube Uh, recording and uh, anyway i'll go on and ask my question like there is uh, a view among certain like intellectuals who have come out and said that if you are going to challenge free speech you know the first uh, victims of free speech uh, like uh, would be the minorities be it linguistic racial religious whatever these are the, the first to face the consequences in case uh, you try to curb speech So I'd like to know your views on this. And uh, uh, labeling is—is is it not a subset of these same things like cancel culture and free speech, so that you label people? And this is happening across the world, you know. So, uh, which is used uh, offending labels you put on certain people, certain groups of people, so, uh, to curb their speech, uh, like you know, so people don't. believe whatever they have to say or don't do not take them seriously all this people who have lost control over the narrative the discourse are trying to do all this like we can see this group out of proportions like this is gone now anyway thank you manoj i mean the, the question is very simple i mean i understand what you ask for example can somebody get a protection from being criticized if you do not have majority i would say that nobody is protected from being criticized no idea is protected from being criticized you should be able to ask questions about everything you should be able to criticize or make a different point of view on anything and everything nobody is protected because they don't have majority if somebody is a minority they don't get immediately i um, mean a, a kind of a, a shelter from all kind of different point of view and what is a minority minority is a minority position is the position that is not followed by the majority while they are being minority itself is having a different opinion than their opinion which is against them if one group of people are minorities because they are not elected to the parliament so the majority opinion is rejecting their position can they reject their position in that point i think there is no protection for anybody because somebody is a minority or a micro minority even any position for example small cults they are micro minorities can you criticize them yes we should be able to criticize them you should be able to criticize the majority point of view as well as the minority point of view if you find that is wrong there is no protection that shall be available to people on the basis of their support level on the other side that's having said that i should also focus that the last person who has a point of view which is dissenting the the collective voice of a country or a nation or a religion or whatever it is the last lonely person should have the right to speak their point of view also without having the fear of being oppressed if for example 1.4 billion people believe in something and one lonely person believes in a different thing which is against those positions nobody should oppress him if he speak that different opinion that's the, the democracy is being you know defined i mean progressively and the, the latest definition that we have is when the last lone person can speak his opinion without fear of consequence that is what democracy is while he having the, the smallest minority having their opinion to speak their view the whole other people can have their right to reject that position criticize that position and no minority ever will get a, 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 a protection simply because they are a minority every opinion every view every point of view every unacceptable idea can be rejected can be ridiculed can be criticized and they should be able to defend their position with their facts not by using violence that shall be the law thank you thank you sanal sanal ji about the labeling part um can you explain it a little bit more for example here in kerala we have uh, people calling them sangees or uh, rss chaddis yeah, yeah, yeah. white nationalists fascists 
So yeah. this is all so we can see, you know, it is all evolved along with this cancel culture. Yes. yes and, uh, you know, trying to curb free speech. So this... That's a very interesting point. I would like to speak about that also. All around the world, after the Second World War, there is a very popular method of silencing the opponents. One way is calling them a fascist. Any opinion that you don't like, you can say that that's fascism. Because fascism was an idea that was rejected by the world, that was defeated in the Second World War. So you don't like something you can call immediately. The easiest way to branch the person as a fascist. And who all are called fascists in the whole world? I mean, a lot of politicians were called as fascists. That's a kind of branding, labeling. It's a method of sightlining people, ostracizing people by calling them names. In United States, for a long time, especially during the Cold War time, anybody who is a communist or pro-communist was socially ostracized. And anybody who is, I mean, broadly even left, we're all called communists. One good example is Madeleine Moreau here, who was never a communist, but she was, she was an atheist. When atheism was not that popular in the United States like it is now, in 1960s, when she spoke about atheism, she was called a communist. It was a branding. She was called a kami. That was the American word that was kobi, they call it, called her. She was not one. This branding is an escape position. Those people who are afraid to face ideas, and defend their views or counter their opponent opposing views, they would like to get easy solutions by coloring them, blackening them, or putting an unfavorable mark on them to come out in white. That's, I mean, I'm not using black and white with this uh, racial I mean, connotations, but as an as example, I can use any other color also. But Branding people is a kind of, you know, old form of cancel culture. You can call, you, you have said the example of uh, Kerala or India, for example. For example, in India, uh, anybody, I mean, who would uh, like to criticize a person who would not support a position that somebody has can call him uh, a fascist easily. I mean, anybody can be called a fascist in India or anybody who do not support the position of certain political parties can be immediately branded with uh, funny names, like you can be called like a person of Sanghi. Sanghi is a terminology that is used in India to identify that they are closer to Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, the Hindu organization, which is asking for Hindu nation. That's an organization that was established in 1924. So you can be immediately branded as a Sanghi. People are afraid, for example, if you criticize the political opponents of the, the present regime in the center, they will be immediately branded by some people as an associate of the Hindu nationalism movement. So people are afraid to be, those people who are afraid to be identified like that are afraid and they withdraw. And that's precisely what they want. So what I suggest is that don't be afraid of any kind of branding. Don't be afraid of any kind of ostracism. Don't be afraid if somebody else wants to take your point of view back to you because you will be accused if you say something. Come on, reject them because they don't have the courage to defend their position. They have only one way to handle it. That's by isolating people. Let people speak their opinion, let people come out with whatever views they want to have. If some people want to support the left movement, let them support the left movement. If suppose somebody wants to support some other political movement, let them support that. But you are not entitled to brand people and sightline people just because they have a different political point of view. That is precisely another form of uh, cancel culture, another form of uh, calling out people, socially isolating, socially cornering, and, and ostracizing people is not part of a civilized world. This moment, I think we can end this session. So thank you everybody for joining. And uh, it's just uh, um, 
another thing that i wanted to say is that everybody gets an opportunity to ask a question if you put your hands raised you will always get a chance uh, when it's your turn you can always ask your question even if it's a opposite opinion or a opinion which is uh, for the topic so i think we have to follow a particular pattern every time so thank you everybody for cooperating and thank you sir for explaining this so uh, brilliantly and i we have more relevant topics coming up next week so hope to see you everybody next week thank you thank you thank you shubhi thank you other people other friends who are moderating in uh, uh, in the clubhouse uh, people who are supporting helen disha uh, wawa all friends and uh, uh, we come to an end of this meeting thank you very much but never be afraid to ask questions if you don't accept something question it ask questions that's the only way that we can come better opinions better point of views and closer to truth and reality ask questions question anything that is not acceptable thank you very much mm -hmm.